Howdy, gang, and welcome once again to the Duct Tape Studios. I'm Jeff McAleer, your host here at the Gaming Gang channel. Thanks for joining me once again. Today, I am going to unbox and take a first look at one of my most eagerly anticipated board games of 2024. That's right, I am talking about the Plum Island Horror from GMT Games. This is designed by my very good friend, Herman Lutman, and graphics are provided by Terry Leeds. Now, this game is for one to four players, ages 14 and up, plays in around 45 minutes per player, and does carry an MSRP of $95. And it is available right now. So all that said, let's swing on over to the other camera because here I've got the Plum Island Horror. So first of all, let's get rid of the shrink. It's creating a little bit more glare than I would like. Although this does have a bit of a sheen to the cover, so and at least we got rid of most of that glare. So do want to point out a few things before we jump on in. First of all, my friends over at GMT Games were kind enough to provide me with this review copy. But neither I nor anyone else affiliated with the gaming gang has received any other sort of compensation for me to share this coverage with you. These days, it's very, very important to know that. Also, keep in mind, this is not a review. You just saw me take the shrink wrap off of this box. So I know a little bit about this game, but I really want to dive in and check this out because I am super excited all right let's take a look at the back here i'm not going to read all of this but i will give you a bit of a rundown october 24th year unknown i have to chuckle because that's actually my birthday the year is known but that is my birthday a super storm slammed into plum island off the east coast of the united states and plunged the island into a particularly horrifying apocalyptic nightmare. The island's secret biological research facility suffered catastrophic damage and was quickly inundated with a horrifically lethal mixture of chemicals. The poor souls who succumbed to the toxins were reanimated as monstrous altered mutations. But the true horror was yet to come. <laughs> Alrighty then, I gotta say, I love the homage to EC Comics that the box cover presents. That is awesome. All we needed was the little Crypt Keeper or the Witch. I forget who the third uh, little mascot for EC Horror Comics was, but I just love this. That is just fantastic. Should also point out, this box is really hefty. This is probably going to be jam-packed with goodness. So let's get this open. So first of all, we've got our rule book. So that's what we're going to dive in first. And we also have a reference guide. Now, if you had caught my news piece that I had shared recently about the Plum Island Horror, you know that I sort of have the impression this is kind of the game that Herman Lutman would have designed if he had had the resources available to him when he did Dawn of the Zeds, which, of course, is one of my all-time favorite games. I love Dawn of the Zeds, and if you are a fan of zombie movies and zombie games, but even if you're not a big fan of zombie games, you really do owe it to yourself to pick up Dawn of the Zeds. But we're not here to talk about Dawn of the Zeds, no. We are here to talk about the Plum Island Horror. So let's jump on in. So we get a bit of an introduction, it looks like. So it's going to give us a breakdown of what happened as far as this super storm and the chemicals that were unleashed. So we get the game overview. The Plum Island Horror is a one to four player game of cooperative gameplay as players try to work together to defeat the deadly onslaught of the monstrous horrors in their attempt to overwhelm not only the island, but the mainland U.S. as well. 
Each player will control one of six unique factions which represent various groups who populate the island. Each faction has its own strengths and weaknesses, and thus players must coordinate with one another to maximize the effects of their abilities. Players are playing together as a team, attempting to synchronize their efforts to save Plum Island and its residents. If they do that, they will win together as a group and receive accolades from the world. If not, they will lose together and share the blame equally for failing humankind. So it's giving us a breakdown of what is included. So we've got various different cards. We have faction mats for each of the factions. That's kind of cool. We have standees for our factions. I think there's over 35 standees in this. We've got some custom dice. We've got tiles. We have our mutation standees, game markers, turn order tokens, as well as some wooden cubes. So it's going to show us how to set up the game. That's kind of cool. It's giving us step-by-step -step instructions for how to get everything set up. First contact. So here's our board. And if you are familiar with Dawn of the Zeds, it wasn't really advertised as a States of Siege game, which was a series of games that Victory Point Games used to have back in the old days before it became kind of an offshoot of Tabletop Tycoon. So what you used to do in these various different States of Siege games is it was kind of a tower defense. You had these different tracks that your opponents would come down and you needed to be able to defend a center space. And if you let any forces get there, then you would lose. And there were a variety of different genres of games that utilized the States of Siege, mostly historical games. But in my opinion, I think the most famous of them, even though it wasn't really considered a States of Siege game by Victory Point Games, would be Dawn of the Zeds. So it looks like we do have some tracks that the horrors are going to be moving along. And it looks like we also have some areas of the island that are going to be defended. So we've got our gameplay, our sequence of play. So we have the hunger phase, which takes place in night game rounds only. Then we have our activity phase. Turn order tokens are drawn and resolved until all tokens have been drawn. There are three different types of tokens that may be drawn during the activity phase. There's the player activation token, which is going to activate particular factions. We have fate tokens, which is looking like it's going to spawn horrors as well as activate horrors. And then we have an impending doom token, which is going to have us draw an event card. And then we will have our end phase. So our hunger phase, I'm taking a guess that's going to be when we have our horrors attacking. During the hunger phase of each night game round, the first of which occurs during the third round of the game, players will need to feed their units with supplies. Oh, okay. So we have to supply our units. Here I was thinking it was the horrors that needed to be fed, but I guess not. I see that it's. it looks like it's kind of a supply phase here for the players. Then we have activities. So we have the crisis adrenaline phase, player action phase, follow action phase. We've got our fate tokens and then spawning new horrors. And I'm going to take a stab in the dark that we will have a variety of unique mutations that the players are going to have to deal with. Then we have the impending doom token. And then we've got our end phase where we replenish locations. That's night game rounds only. Mutation regeneration. Biohazard infection. Refill the turn order bag. And then we advance the game round marker. So we get an overview of the different actions. So we've got move combat, crowd control, because you are trying to evacuate the civilians from the island as well. Repair, 
build a compound, use a location action, heal, or use a special action, or you can reposition. It's going to break down what each of those represents. This looks like this is presented very concisely, and I'm really digging it. For one, I, I like this presentation. It's not kind of typical GMT. It has a little bit of a different look. It's got a little bit of a different feel to it, a different font than what we normally see from GMT games. So I, I think that's kind of cool. It's, it's sort of also kind of giving us a little bit of a comic book text look to it as well. So here we've got our details regarding movement. I think we've got our combat. Yep, combat overview. So how things match up. Combat hits. Ranged combat. Gunship combat. Well, that's interesting. Got special combat markers such as Molotov cocktails and pistols. All right, now we got victory and defeat. So the horrors win if they achieve any of these four win conditions. The island becomes a toxic wasteland. I would throw in a New Jersey joke, but actually I don't think New Jersey's that bad. The island is overrun by monsters. Oh, the humanity. And where is everybody? So it gives us a breakdown of what we've got here. I would assume where is everybody means that the factions are wiped out. So we've got our different game modes. So we have one player mode, two player mode, and three player mode. And of course, the rules as we were looking at them looks as if the assumption is that you're playing with four players. A solitaire game, you would play the two player mode and control both the factions. If you're experienced, you can also play with three player mode or the full four player mode and control all of the factions. So I would take a guess what will happen here. And of course, we haven't dove deeply into these rules, but I would take a guess that the more players you have, the more activations you're going to see from the various different horrors. You'll probably see more of the horrors spawn. So here's our reference guide. So I wonder if this is kind of a GMT playbook. So let's take a look. This booklet is intended as a reference for all rules queries not answered in the main rule book. Interesting. Unlike the rule book, this booklet doesn't expressly teach players how to play the game. Players should first read the rule book in its entirety before referring to this booklet. However, the included example of play provides an overview of gameplay and highlights some strategy tips to employ in play. So it goes through our major sections of this guide. So talking about the game board and how it's broken down, other game components such as standees, counters, and cards, special units, and our example of play. skipped a few too many pages so it looks like okay these are the mutations then we've got our vip civilians artwork looks really cool i really like this naked and afraid plum island <laughs> so of course there is gonna be some humor in this because it's my pal herman lutman and you know it's this isn't a historical game this isn't a war game, so I figured we'd get a little bit of humor in here. It's Naked and Afraid Plum Island. This is the cast of one of the most popular reality TV shows around. Despite the obnoxiously conceited participants and standoffish crew, they're also quite influential. <laughs> We've got uh, retirement home seniors. We've got Rex Kramer famous for being an ace jet fighter pilot during the Korean War. Rex was also a MASH unit helicopter pilot in America's Cup yacht skipper, and he crochets Afghans. <laughs> nice. Okay, so we're going to get into an example of play. 
going through some of the different rounds. If I remember correctly, I think the research facility that uh, exposes everyone to these, well, not everyone, but a lot of people on the island, thus making them mutate, well, I think it kills them, <laughs> and then they're reanimated. It's called Pearl, the Plum Island Research Lab, I think it was called. This looks like it's going to be a blast. I have to say, if you're not overly familiar with Herman Lutman as a game designer, he designs a slew of different genres of games. He'll do science fiction games, and of course, obviously, like, this is a horror game, and so is Dawn of the Zeds. But he also does a lot of excellent historical war games, too. So he is a designer with a lot of irons and a lot of fires. So we've got our glossary here. And I'll be the first to point out, even my least favorite Herman Lutman game designs are good games. So it's important to keep that in mind. He is a game designer of note, in my opinion. So we got a quick reference here. Okay, so it looks like next we're going to take a look at the faction mats. They are single-sided. You know what? I'm going to save that because we'll zoom in and take a peek at that. We'll get a little closer look. So we've got, looks like, a game round tracker. We have, if I can get them out of the box here, a variety of counter sheets. So we'll take a peek at those. Let's take a look at the board because I'm taking a guess that the board is, is fairly large. And it is a mounted board. Oops. Okay. So, yes, it is going to be pretty large and long. So, it looks like it's two panels wide. And is this four panels in length? Yes. Okay. So, what we'll do is we'll kind of take a look through, try to squeeze as much real estate on screen as I possibly can. So these are our tracks. So I'll take a wild stab that we are going to spawn, at least to start off with, the horrors up here. And I would think as they move further into the island that uh, they'll actually, it, when we're like spawning horrors, they'll probably pop up where horrors are already. So we've got the Pine Barrens, Werner Bread, Inga Forest, Schnitzel Brewery, John's Hunting Lodge. Ooh, we've got the Clementine State Penitentiary. Wonder if we've got prisoners. I wonder if those are, I don't know if they'd be the VIP civilians. Oceanside Industrial Park, Whitecap Estates, Carrie's Corner. There you go, Pearl East. So it is called Pearl. Pearl West. More white cap estates, Riverhead Zoo, the old Republic Airport. The art on this is really nice, and it still has kind of that comic book vibe to it. Let's see, so here we've got the beach. So we've got the Cherry Pit Grove, Tom's Gas and Go, our fire station, police station, Pomegranate Mall. Anton's Schlop Stop. I guess it's a uh, like diner or something, maybe. Another fire station. <laughs> the Toll Bridge. Boo's Barbecue. Island Wide Light and Power. Plum Island High School. Sherry's Berries. The Good Samaritan Hospital. Mark's Foreign Auto. Oh, here's our corporate headquarters for Pearl. Another police station. Uh, we've got another beach here. So we also have the Great South Bay Bridge, which I would think is probably an important defensive location. Maybe, maybe not. Now, we do see some arrows here. 
which looks as if this is how maybe not only the horrors move, but maybe how the various different factions move around. Although the arrows are pointing down the board, so maybe it's only the horrors. Okay, let's see what we've got left here on the board. So we have Erica Woods, Town Hall, Pino Winery, uh, Hampson Shores, more beach area here. We've got Fred's Fish Market and Atlantic Point Lighthouse Docks, Coast Guard Station, Greenport Docks, VFW Memorial Park, another police headquarters, and the Town Dump. <laughs> we got a baseball field here. <laughs> this looks really cool. And then as you can see, we've got a ship, a, a smaller boat here at the docks. I'm telling you, this is looking like this is going to be one really fun game. Okay, so that is the board. Let's see what other goodies we've got. So we've got some dice. We've got baggies. We got our GMT baggies. We have various different colored cubes. So it looks like we've got black, green, red, and yellow. Those might be for each player. That's a possibility there. We've got our draw bag, because yes, oh, we have two draw bags. Because I know we've got the tokens that we're, we're pulling to activate horrors as well as the factions. And then maybe this is for events, although we've got an event deck. It's kind of cool, we got the biohazard symbol on it. Oh, you know what? I bet you put the horrors in here so that they're randomly spawning. Okay, so we've got both of those. Pretty nice draw bags here. We've got standees. Or I should say stands for our standees. And take a peek at the custom dice. See what we've got on the faces. I would guess they're all the same. So we have a half a heart, a hit, a shield, and a full broken heart, and then a couple of blank sides on it. So we have six of those. Very cool. And then we've got various decks of cards which we will take a look at in just a moment. But first, I will zoom in a little bit, and we will start taking a look at some of the counters and the faction boards. I think we'll tackle the faction boards first. There's some tokens here. Okay, so I am going to zoom on in this should be good okay so we have greenport township so we've got the mayor we have a compound which is a surplus armory we've got fire marshal bill we'll fly him <laughs> ralph norton all right so we're getting we're getting a, a nod here to the honeymooners because he works at the town dump. He's sanitation department, which is what Ed Norton and the honeymooners did. Uh, Ed Cramden, so that's supposed to be Ralph, who uh, works for the transit authority because in the honeymooners he drove a bus. Oh, that's wild. That is so funny. And then it talks about, like, their special abilities. And then we get a breakdown of their various different factors. So I'm going to take a guess. Well, we see movement. We can tell that's movement. I'm going to take a guess. We've got some combat and defensive. So here looks like these can provide healing would be my guess. Okay, so that's Greenport Township. 
We've got the Islanders Athletic Club. So you've got the coach. We've got the ball pro, groundskeeper, sporting goods store. <laughs> this is their compound. Oh, here we got the horrors. So hold on. We'll, we'll look at those last. So here we've got the Plum Island <laughs> Constables. So we've got the chief. We've got the commander. We've got the detective squad. We've got Chase the dog. Yes. Don of the Zeds had a dog character too. Loved it. Pickles the dog, if I remember correctly. Uh, Officer Joe Friday. <laughs> Little dragnet reference there. And then we got the paddy wagon, which is their compound. It's an armored vehicle. It's the Pearl Security Services. So this, this must be like their commanders with the red. So we've got another doctor. He's probably a scientist. Oh, yeah, it does say scientist. Security, the cleaning crew, and they get Compound W. Got the National Guard. So we've got their senior officer, heavy weapons. We've got... Military police, they have Strong Point Delta. That's their compound. We've got NPC units. So we've got Shore Patrol. We've got the football team, the Wolverines. We've got the hero of the day. And then, oh, here's our breakdown of the uh, stats. So it's telling us what each of these represents. Then we have... Horror's hit potential. So that's single-sided there. We get the Neighborhood Watch. So this is another faction. So we get Bill Rogers. I would have loved to have seen it be Fred Rogers because, you know, that old urban legend about Mr. Rogers being a Marine. And stuff like that. Sergeant Rock. York. There you go, Sergeant York. So it looks like we've got a couple of just civilians here as well. They get Fort Courage. That is their compound. And lastly, we've got our horror mutations. So we've got Birds of Prey, an infected Sasquatch. Jeez. How could the Sasquatch stay hidden before it became infected on an island? We've got Leapers, Most Wanted. Oh, I bet you that's a mutated prisoner. Murder Hornets and Wild-Eyed Rats. Sweet. Okay, so these are some of the factions as well as the mutations. And then we also get this kind of explanation here. So this is... Actually, these are units, I think, and then this is just kind of giving us a breakdown on how the stats are broken up, what, the, what those stats represent. Okay, so our first punch board. These are our factions that get drawn for activation. That's what it looks like here, that these would go into the draw bag. Dual-sided. So we get a symbol, and then we also get what they represent. So Greenport Township, the Plum Island Research Lab, Security Services. Okay, so we've got those. Now we have some various different tokens, supplies, damage token, overrun positions, stunned, uh, plus one movement for the horrors there. These are our compounds. An exhausted location. I would take a guess that maybe once per round, you're able to use a location's ability. And if you use it the one time, you have to probably put an exhausted token down on it. Here we got Molotov cocktails, pistols. Here we got the Coast Guard, the Texas Navy, uh, air medical evacuation. And shows these are damaged. Okay, cool. 
And then finally, oh, I shouldn't say finally, I think we got a few more of these. So this is a murder of horrors. So these are probably just our general monsters. And they all look the same. So they don't have stats or anything like that. So all of these are going to be considered to have the same abilities. But we do have those like special mutated horrors. Here are our standees for the various different factions. So each of the factions has five standees. And then here we've got our mutants as well. Or I should say mutated horrors. And once again, it's got kind of that comic book art style. Definitely liking that. Appears we've got some informational counters here. Here are those NPC units. Got some more horrors here. These look like these would be groups of civilians. These are our kind of special civilian VIPs right here. There we go. I wonder if these VIP civilians start off in specific places. That's very possible. Okay, and then we've got our tracking board. So this is where we're going to track our, our rounds. So this takes place over a period of three days. We've got a biohazard track, overrun points track, and the mandatory evacuation points track. So this is one of the automatic losses becoming a toxic wasteland. Looks like overrun would this possibly be that you're looking at so many civilian casualties? Okay, so here we've got those cubes. So we got biohazard cubes. So we've got yellow, red, and then we have hit cubes. So that's an available pool. This is a holding pool. And then we get a breakdown of our VIP civilians once again. So as an example, we have Rachel's Uber Chakra Yoga, a very dedicated yoga studio whose members all have solid cores and a wonderful spiritual effect on other survivors. This unit is worth three EP, so it must be evacuation points, probably your victory points that you're tracking. Probably right here. And it increases the EP value of each civilian's unit that is evacuated with them in the same evacuation action. Nice. Just going to talk about what each of these are able to do if they have something special. Otherwise, they might just be worth the EP points. Ah, here we get our quick reference, which we did see on the back of the rule book as well with the various different... Uh, faces for the sequence of play, repair table, overrun points, close combat damage, and ranged combat damage. Okay. Now, what we've got left are the decks of cards. So let's peek at these, and I will actually zoom in just a little bit more, and let's get these open. So here are fate cards. They are all fate cards. So it looks like we've got some player aid cards. Yep, so we have four of these. So it appears as if these cards are explaining the various different actions. Then we got event cards. We're not going to look at all the cards, but we will take a peek at some of each of these decks. So we have a search card. Oh, 
Okay. Are these all search cards? Okay, so yes, yeah, so that is another deck. So we've got three additional decks of cards here. So first of all, we've got the event deck. Bigfoot lives! Spawn the infected Sasquatch mutation standee in the Pine Barrens area. So there we go. So we do have some of these, like, mutated creatures are going to be popping up in specific areas. Frenzied horrors! Draw a fate number. All horror units in the area farthest down the track number, i.e. in the highest lettered area, will move along a side connection to an area on the adjacent track. If there are two side connections, the horrors will move into the area on the lower numbered track. Note that no combat is started with this move. A horrific encounter! Draw fate number, get an attack number, then reference each area on that track, which contains both a horrors unit and a non-horrors unit. Apply each situation as follows. So there we go. Newly ruptured vats. Draw three cubes from the biohazard bag. There we go. That's what that is used for. We have a draw from the bag. We fill it with cubes. It says apply their effects to the biohazard track. Place the drawn cubes back into the bag. We've got Cascading Horrors. Check the map for any tracks that do not have at least one Murder of Horrors stack on them. If any track does not have a Murder of Horrors stack, immediately spawn a Murder of Horrors stack in that <laughs> track spawn zone. Nice. This looks like this is going to be right up my alley. So we got the fake cards. Spawn on track six, activate track one, no event card. So you would spawn on track three. So these must be your spawning horrors or stacks of horrors on these tracks and activating horrors on these tracks. I'm not sure what these numbers would represent. Spawn chaos. Draw two fate numbers. Spawn Murder of Horrors units on the track numbers equaling each of the drawn fate numbers. Okay, reanimated. All right, cool. And then finally, we have got the search deck. Call it an airstrike! <laughs> Check your unit's administration rating. And then I guess if it's high enough, you're going to get to call in an airstrike. A paranormal encounter, allegedly. <laughs> From dusk till dawn. So some of these have a little bit of artwork on them. Some of them do not. Some look like they have, like, this has kind of a table that you're going to take a look at. The legend of the Plum Island Mermaid. <laughs> Motor City Madman. Hey, it's for our buddy the Madman up in Detroit. There you go. He's got his own card. Hopefully it's good. Hopefully it's something good. Oh, this is this is just. I'm telling you, this is looking like this is gonna be a blast. All right. So let's put everything back in the box here. And of course, we get a cool insert with the cover art so we've got the three decks of cards as well as the four player aid cards six custom dice a slew of stands the various different cubes which now we know actually go into the biohazard bag right there and then we've got the other draw bag, which looks like we put our activation counters into. We've got the cool mounted board. We've got a breakdown of our VIP civilians as well as our game track. 
we have four and a half counter sheets with all the goodies there. We've got the faction mats as well as our mutations and uh, some other tracking there as well. We've got our reference guide. And then we've got our rule book. And that is what we find when we take everything from the Plum Island Horror outside the box. Sweet. And of course, I will have a review of the Plum Island Horror in the very near future because I am looking to actually get this to the game table with some of the gang this weekend. Very nice. Very nice. So stay tuned for that. Once again, big thank you to my friends over at GMT Games for sending along a review copy of the Plum Island Horror. All right, that is it for this time out. If you like this video, by all means, please give it a quick thumbs up. Subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel if you haven't already. And if you do subscribe, don't forget, ring that bell because it'll not only let you know when I share videos such as this unboxing and first look, it'll also inform you when my live stream, The Gaming Gang Dispatch, airs Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday evenings right here on YouTube at 7 p.m. Central as I bring you the latest in tabletop gaming news of the day. Of course, when you're not watching videos here on The Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com. For a lot more tabletop gaming news, reviews, and a bunch of other things you are not going to find here on the YouTube channel. You know the drill. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. Once again, I'm Jeff McAleer. Thank you very much for taking time out to watch this video. And until I see you next time, here's hoping all of you get to enjoy plenty of great gaming with your gang.